Well, last year, New Zealand passed a conversion therapy law. It's a dangerous, flawed law in which parents can be criminalised and liable up to five years imprisonment simply for affirming that their sons are boys and their daughters are girls and wanting to protect their children from confusion, puberty blockers, wrong sex hormones and the castration of healthy body parts. The law can also criminalise counsellors, carers and teachers, faith-based schools and places of worship. Perhaps worst of all though, the new law voted for by all but eight brave but principled members of parliament says that consent is irrelevant. Apparently the mantra, my body, my choice, doesn't apply here. So those who dare to seek inner freedom and healing from unwanted behavioural or thought patterns in the area of sexuality or gender confusion will have nowhere to turn as a result of this new law. The law oppresses and violates the right to seek whatever lifestyle you desire. Now many people have said, oh Bob, don't be serious, don't be so dramatic, this won't happen. Sharing biblical teaching and sharing your testimony isn't going to get you in trouble. Well, I wish I wasn't right, but unfortunately I am. This type of threat is exactly what the activists wanted right from day one. Let me show you. So a Christian charity worker in Malta could face jail time after he claimed that his faith enabled him to turn away from a homosexual lifestyle he no longer wanted. Matthew Greck, who's 33, faces potential fines and imprisonment for allegedly failing, falling afoul of his country's ban on conversion practices. And it was when he explained to a local media outlet last year how he left homosexuality behind because he came to believe it was wrong. Now, Malta. Malta is an island nation between Sicily and the coast of North Africa. It was the first country in the European Union to criminalise conversion therapy practices. And despite its small size, the Maltese culture is seen as a forerunner and pioneer in Europe, consistently ranking at the top of LGBT activists' lists of most progressive countries, or most white countries. In fact, Malta was even used and quoted as a model for New Zealand's law. So Malta is definitely a trailblazer in terms of worldwide trends. And according to a transcript of the interview with the media, at no point did Greg invite anyone to attend therapy or change their sexual orientation or gender identity, though he was critical of the Maltese conversion therapy law, and he explained how he came to believe that homosexuality is not an identity, but rather a practice that is incompatible with his Christian faith, his personal view. A Greek said that after LGBT activists with ties to the government and the Malta gay rights movement reported him to police for the interview, he now faces up to €5,000 in fines or up to five months in prison for advertising conversion practices by sharing his testimony. And ironically, the journalists who interviewed him also have upcoming court dates and face potential criminal sanctions for their part in conducting the interview. Well, that's a good way of shutting down the media that the government disagrees with. Now, Greg became involved with the UK-based International Federation for Therapeutic and Counselling Choice. Uh, let me just show you that logo. It's an organisation that aims to promote a caring, non-judgmental environment where people who choose to move away from their unwanted feelings and behaviours can find the support they're seeking. Now, this aim is actually similar to an amendment to our law that was promoted by the New Zealand Christian Network, but the politicians didn't want a bar of it. And Greg is also a trustee of Core Issues Trust. It's a group that works closely with the IFTCC, and it supports men and women with homosexual issues who voluntarily seek change in sexual expression and preference. Now, uh, here's the interesting bit. I know Matt. I met, a, uh, met him in Hungary late last year when shock horror, I attended the international conference of the IFTCC and was a speaker at the IFTCC conference. <laughs> Whoops, guilty as charged. Uh, dear Human Rights Commission in New Zealand, you can email me at family first. I don't care. I'm proud to be associated with an organisation that respects freedom and personal autonomy and that doesn't buy into the new religion of identity politics, which all must bow down to. But enough talking from me, let's meet 
Matthew. I'm a Christian. Everything changed. I moved away from a homosexual lifestyle. And for sharing this hope and story, I am now facing a criminal court and being charged with advertising so-called conversion practices. Let's be factual here. This law is banning my freedom. It's banning my views on traditional and biblical marriage. See, this is the thing. What is conversion therapy? I was not offering a service, was I? We were talking about my story. That's basically a conversation, a free conversation that is happening around sexuality. And that being linked with advertising, so-called conversion practices, that is scandalous conservative news platform called PM News Malta that approached me uh, desiring to hear a little bit more and um, seeing that it was a conservative platform I was even more excited to support that so I went ahead and I uh, was asked about my story and um, a few days after I was called by a local police station in Malta uh, saying that I am wanted to go and present myself at the police station for some interrogation and um, yeah, I was told that three people uh, reported me and the hosts to the police uh, claiming and accusing us that we were advertising uh, what the Maltese law calls conversion practices. Because I don't understand it. See, this is the thing. What is conversion therapy? Nobody knows what conversion therapy is. People think of electric shocks, you know, they're thinking all sorts of weird things where people are forced into a room to maybe see perverse things or be told that they're disgusting and all this madness. The thing is, when I came to Christ, I read the Bible, I found scriptures about homosexuality and I said, wow, you know, God sees me as a homosexual, but if I repent from this behavior, I can be set free from this label and I wouldn't need to wear that every day anymore. And so I repented from sin, I stopped the relationship that I was in with a man and I, I started living holy and that was it. Like I started getting to know who I am in God's eyes, who I am as a man and growing in that identity in Christ. And so to confuse this pure support and help that is being offered to people with aversive and harmful methods in therapy that are not being used anymore, that nobody can prove anymore is just out of proportion. For us Christians, change is possible, change is real, and it's an experience that has brought us so much joy, so much freedom and hope and liberation, and it deserves to be celebrated. That's the point. So to be confronted with a law that takes that away from us and tells us, no, that's not true, you can't change. It's very defiant against uh, the truth that we hold in our hearts. Well, as you saw there, Matthew Greck had his, uh, last week he had his day in court and his case will continue to be heard in June. Uh, and so they record a little video outside his court case last week. What are your expectations? I'm loving to see the church united here. We've just been praising God together before the criminal court hearing. So we're very expectant. Um, I think uh, this law here in Malta is shutting down uh, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, freedom of expression, fundamental and basic freedoms, and it should have no place in Malta. And and as as we can see, it's uh, it's doing it's trying to come against the Word of God, the Bible, uh, fundamental Christian belief. This law tells you how you're supposed to think about sexuality. It does not make room for other understandings. Uh, doesn't make room for this to be challenged. And we're not here to conform to LGBT religion or indoctrination. We're here to defy that because it's not in the best interest of our country and certainly not in the best interest of families across the world. Uh, we know that this case has been followed by many other countries and many Christians, many therapists, many people who live this lifestyle. Do you want to address them? Do you want to tell them something today? We're here to also defend people's right to offer counseling, including pastors, you know, to offer counseling in a biblical way, in a sound way that works uh, towards heterosexuality, works towards family building, you know. Uh, and so it's a very positive um, outlook on sexuality that needs to be protected and defended. And we're going to do that right to the end. 
Yeah, and uh, Greg noted the irony that the first case of this kind should be in Malta. It's got a notable position, for those of you who know your Bibles, one of the first Roman colonies to convert to Christianity, the island featured in the New Testament as the place where the Apostle Paul was shipwrecked and left unharmed from the bite of a venomous snake that emerged from a fire. And Greg said, quote, That story speaks to us this day because when Paul arrived in Malta, a fire was set because it was cold and a snake fastened itself around his arm. He shook it off, told it where it needs to go, and it went back to the fire. People at first thought he was being judged by the gods because that snake fastened itself around his arm. But when they saw that nothing happened to him, they changed their minds, end quote. And Greg likened the biblical story to his legal battle and the spiritual struggles of people like him who fight to maintain their faith despite their feelings amidst what he sees as a tightening grip of opposition from government and the culture. He said, quote, we are facing the idol of our generation and we're saying we're not going to bow down to you no matter what the cost, end quote. You know, uh, here's what this issue is all about. Convincing people that there are different gender to their biological sex, similar to a lot of the indoctrination happening currently in our schools, is not considered conversion therapy, nor is it considered conversion therapy to encourage a person to explore and develop same-sex attraction, also happening in our schools. But if a same-sex attracted individual wishes to explore and strengthen a heterosexual attraction or lifestyle, or a person wishes to align with their biological sex, that could be illegal, subject to imprisonment to encourage them to do so under our conversion therapy law. So apparently gender and sexuality is fluid, but only in the direction that the LGBT activists demand, only in the direction of their religiosity. And under our conversion therapy law, people like Matthew and many others will be prevented from getting help to live the lifestyle they choose if that lifestyle is heterosexual or based on their biological sex, and children could not be encouraged to embrace their biological sex. Yet again, the state wants to dictate how you raise your children and even how you live your life. Uh, by the way, I asked the Human Rights Commission just recently here in New Zealand how many complaints they'd had to their $2.2 million complaint centre, which was set up to take all the complaints of this terrible practice happening all over to New Zealand. Guess how many? One since the law was passed, and that went no further. It wasn't even about an individual. No referrals to the police, nothing. This was a law looking for a problem that doesn't exist. It's an ideological battle. But I also asked them what engagement had the, uh, has there been over the past two to three years by the Human Rights Commission with individuals like Matthew who made submissions against the new law and who had positive experiences of receiving counselling to deal with unwanted sexuality and gender confusion um, gender confusion issues. Uh, their response was, some people reported initially having a type of positive response to conversion practices, but invariably in time this was not sustained and the inevitable significant harm became clear. Huh. Well, in other words, they never talked to all these people, Tina, Catherine, Emily, Emmanuel, Claire, Carmel, Ian, Laura, Judith, Rose, Josh, Mabel, Leah, Karen, Elizabeth, Keith, Walt Heyer, who by the way is coming to New Zealand to speak at our forum this year, and many others. They're all on our website. No, the Human Rights Commission don't want to know them. Why? Because their experience doesn't match the narrative. So they're ignored and dismissed. Shame on the so-called Human Rights Commission. The rights, but just for those they agree with. Matthew's case and the actions of Malta are exactly what the activists want, and if you're, you're dreaming, if you think that this won't happen in New Zealand. Now, if you want to learn more about New Zealand's new law, we have a guide for parents, for pastors, and for counsellors as to what the law says and its implications. And we've also gone to a leading public law lawyer for advice, and we include their legal advice in the fact sheet. You can download this fact sheet from our website, familyfirst.nz, and also learn about the new law, and there's lots more discussion uh, on, on the website there, freetolive.nz, uh, and it's for your own protection. But then, look, join us as we work to protect families, protect places of faith, protect counsellors, and protect health professionals from a flawed and dangerous law. As our speaker from last year's forum, Joe Dallas, said, 
You can ban conversion therapy, but you'll never, never be able to ban conversion. Mm -hmm.